Uh, good afternoon to everybody and a warm welcome to this W.E.B. Du Bois public lecture and seminar series uh, by the esteemed Professor Michael Burabur. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and um, particularly in these post-COVID times. And um, it's really good to kind of re-engage in these kinds of ways. So Professor Burovoy um, is related to two projects, intellectual projects we're busy with. Uh, the first is the Democratic Marxism series, uh, which is co-hosting um, tonight's event. Uh, the Democratic Marxism series is 10 years old. And essentially it has been about finding a decolonial, ecological and feminist Marx and placing that Marx in dialogue with other currents of anti-capitalism. Um, this series is not premised on the idea that Marxism has all the answers and is leading struggles and leading the world. No, it has to earn its place um, in that context. And my, Professor Burovoy contributed a very uh, seminal and important essay to the first volume in the series, uh, which we deliberately titled Marxisms in the 21st century, it's 21st century, to pluralize the, the idea of Marxism. But Michael has been a very powerful interlocutor within the sort of academy in the US and as a, as a kind of academic uh, Marxist um, to help us think about this tree of Marxism. And that has inspired us in many ways in this journey around the democratic Marxist project. And so we're really excited that he's back um, to continue engaging with us in that kind of vein. The second project, uh, intellectual project that is intersecting and uh, sort of providing a platform for Michael tonight is the Emancipatory Future Studies in the Anthropocene Project. Uh, this project now is about um, four years old. And essentially, it's about the subaltern, uh, the wretched of the earth, being able to anticipate, create, and engage in future world making. And in that project, we've been thinking deeply about decolonial futures. We've been thinking about the body of thought that we have uh, in the social sciences, uh, in the humanities that can help us think about decolonial futures. And so in that context, the lecture tonight, as well as the seminar series uh, over the next few days is very, very um, apposite and important. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite Michelle to just introduce Michael and then we'll get on with your lecture tonight. Thanks. Um, thanks, Vish. Vish decided I should introduce Michael yeah. since I have a because awesome. I have a very personal and long relationship with Michael. Um, so it is it's a real pleasure, Michael, to be introducing you. So Michael recently retired after nearly uh, 50 years as a professor of sociology at the University of California at Berkeley, where he supervised 80 PhD students. Um, he has been an ethnographer of workplaces and ethnographer for those of our GLU students. He's worked in factories and he's done this in Zambia, the United States, Hungary, and Russia. And I have to tell one comic story about Michael and factory work. Apparently he's not very good at it. He's, um, I think he slows the line down a bit. And when he was in Hungary, he uh, was slowing the line down. They were very, they were very tolerant of him, and all the women kind of took him under his, their, their wing because he couldn't speak that well. He spoke it, but he clearly was a foreigner, not good up the line. And um, he would tell them that he was a professor back in the United States, and they'd say, "Yeah, we all have these fantasies." <laughs> so I think that captures Michael being an ethnographer around the world. He can tell you other stories about how. Wherever he goes, the system collapses, but um, that won't happen to us here. He's been to South Africa many times. He has pa published pathbreaking books, including The Color of Class on the Copper Mines, and that's on Zambia. It was from 1972, and that's when I think he actually fell in love with his method of ethnography. He spent two years working on the Zambian copper mines. Um, 
then he then he proceeded with manufacturing consent, the politics of production, the radiant past, and public sociology. In all his work, he has advanced theories of advanced capitalism, the state, socialism, and post-colonialism, while de developing a distinctive methodology called the extended case method. And for those of us who are sociologists, this is a really important book and method that we use. He was president of the American Sociological Association in 2003 and 2004, and he was a president of the International Sociological Association between 2010 and 2014. In both of these roles, one of the things that he did very strategically and meaningfully was he opened up the associations to scholars from the Global South. He was very, very adamant about this. Um, at his retirement party, Michael was awarded the Berkeley Citation. He's going to kill me for sharing this. Um, the Berkeley Citation for his lifetime achievements. The Berkeley Citation is awarded to distinguished individuals or organizations whose contribution to UC Berkeley go beyond the call of duty, but also their achievement, um, they exceed the, the standards of their uh, standards of excellence in their field. But I think what is not, it's not, it's a big deal to get that award, but that's not what's so noteworthy about Michael getting that award. What's noteworthy is that Michael has spent decades criticizing the leadership of UC Berkeley, and he's been a thorn in their side. And despite this, they still gave him their highest award, recognizing his contribution to the university and sociology. Um, he has been a frequent visitor to South Africa. In fact, he was scheduled, we, we originally planned for this lecture series to happen in 2020, and then we all know what happened in 2020, so we had to cancel. Um, and it's long overdue that we have him back. For a while, he was coming almost every year. He has a long history. He came to South Africa first in 1969, I think, um, and he's had a long history with the country uh, in the post-apartheid period. So for me personally, it's, it's wonderful to welcome him back to his South African home. And I will say it is because of Michael that I became a sociologist. Thank you. Yes, it's my turn. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me without a mic? Yeah. yeah. yeah good, good. Well, I'll sit on. Yeah, I'll just show this. Okay. Um, well, thanks very much to both of you. I am delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to be sponsored by Democratic Marxism. That's to honor. But also, this project of yours, with the wish of the emancipatory future studies. Um, so, on the one hand, I've been invited by you, and on the other hand, I've been invited by Michelle in the sociology department. And my intention is um, to give a talk. I'll give some more talks in the next few days, the next tomorrow, and to the following week. My intention uh, is actually to use W.B. Du Bois to marry you two together, to go remarry you, and also to marry particularly the projects of the emancipatory futures and sociology. So that is my task here today. Um, yeah, I've been, as, as Michelle said, I've been visiting South Africa for nearly 60 years. And 66 was the first time I came to South Africa. And I just would like to acknowledge that South Africa really has been a place where um, I became a sociologist, became interested in sociology. And in large part, that is true because I had two very, very close friends, Eddie Webster and Louis Kalinikos. And Louis looked after me. Um, when I was in great distress uh, in 1968, and um, that's when I also met Eddie. So I would like to acknowledge that. And Jackie Cock, where she is at the back, is also a long standing friend. And I'm here uh, to acknowledge their important contributions to my sociology. Um, 13 years ago, I think it was 13, Carl, 2010, Carl Van Holt invited me in this very room to talk about Duff, not Duff and Peter Boys, but a fellow called Pierre Bourdieu, um, a miserable, awkward, frustrating, 
uh, I'm a sociologist. Um, I was not very enthusiastic about Bourdieu, but he had sort of taken sociology in the United States and elsewhere uh, by storm, and I felt it was important for there to be a Marxist critique of Bourdieu. So that's what I came here to do. I think I gave here eight lectures, and it was a bit of a disaster when I realized everybody was asking me, why on earth are you criticizing Bourdieu? Why do you come here to do that? We're not interested in Bourdieu anyhow. So, but I was saved, I was saved by Carl, who actually began defending Bourdieu um, against my critiques. And so that was my last time I gave a series of lectures here. And so I'm hoping that this series will be a little more upbeat. Um, I'm in love with W.B. Du Bois. I'm a great enthusiast. Um, and W.B. Du Bois has also taken sociology in the United States and much less so anywhere else, but has taken sociology in the United States by storm. He is now crowned as the founder of US sociology. And um, he is a hope to convince you today and in following discussions that he is a really very significant figure. Um, I don't think there's been a lot of discussion about W. B. Du Bois in South Africa. Uh, I know of Mosa Badi, who, Badi who, who has been writing about W. B. Du Bois. She seems to be the most prolific in this area, um, at least in the world of sociology, but there are a few others. Um, so I'm here to sort of try and fill uh, a gap. Yes, yes. So let me say something about Du Bois because maybe many people here. I'm delighted, by the way, to see that the Glue people are here. That's another great institution of this. And there are even members of UJ here. Um, so thanks for coming, Patrick and others. Um, so, yes, yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about W.E.B. Du Bois. He was born in 1868 and he died in 1963 at the age of 95, or possibly 96. I forgot when his birthday is in February. Doesn't matter. It's 95 or 96. And he lived an extraordinary life. Of which combines hope and despair. And he faced much despair, but never lost hope. And I find him to be, in that regard, very inspirational. Till his dying day, he was continually engaging in the politics of the world. Educated at Fifth University, historically black university in the South, in Tennessee, in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, a university that was created in 1866, a year after the end of the Civil War. He then went on to Harvard, where he got his another degree, a, a BA degree, and then eventually will get a PhD in history. He was the first African American to get a PhD from Harvard. In between, in a few years, in between, between 1892 and 1894, in 1892 and 1894, he went to the University of Berlin, and it was in Berlin that sociology was the new science, and it was there that he was captivated by sociology. Sociology was, a, if it was ever mentioned at all, was a dirty word in the United States, particularly in places like Harvard and this. So that's his education. He was a literary figure. He was more than a scholar, a historian. We'll hear more about that. Um, and a sociologist. He was also a novelist. Well, sort of a novelist. He's been very much criticized as a novelist. I regard his novels as more like sociological fiction, quite important in the conceptualization of alternative ways in which we may live and organize our lives. So he was a novelist, he was a poet, he was a dramatist, um, and he was famously the editor of the Crisis magazine from 1910 to 1934, which we'll hear about in a few minutes. Um, 
uh, for 24 years, um, he was the editor of this magazine, which was the magazine of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, um, which was the major civil rights organization of the time. It was founded in 1910. He was a co-founder of it. Um, then we can come to his activism. He was a socialist. He was a pan-Africanist organizing um, five of, a major organizer, I should say, of five of the pan-African congresses, and he was the one in 1945. Um, he was a, uh, civil rights activist and advocate, um, and he also was a very significant figure, in fact, a world leader in the disarmament movement after World War II. And he that got into a lot of trouble with the U.S. state. His life was largely conducted outside academia, where he was marginalized, and eventually, it was the state, the U.S. state, that actually became um, his bitter enemy. And he left the United States in 1961, went to exile in Ghana, um, newly independent Ghana. At the invitation of President Krumah, he went, spent the last two years of his life in Ghana. But not before leaving, he insisted on joining the Communist Party, which he had refused to all his life. It's an interesting story by itself. Well, that gives you some background as to who W.B. Du Bois was. These four talks, lectures, seminars, we'll see how it goes, um, are really a great challenge for me to talk about them, and I haven't talked about Du Bois in succession quite like this before. What I want to do is to give each talk a sense of the extraordinary variation and change in his life, in his perspectives, in his politics, in his sociology, in his understanding of the world, and particularly his understanding of heroes. Um, so each session will embrace a trajectory of his thinking with four different slices. And the slice today is going to be a life of critical engagement. And I'm going to critically engage the concept of critical engagement. Um, and more of that in a few minutes. And tomorrow, I'm going to talk about uh, racial capitalism, um, and uh, we will <laughs> peripherally engage the issue um, that the issues that Cedric Robinson, some of you may know of, Cedric Robinson has uh, has raised um, with regard to racial capitalism. So another fraught concept, just like public sociology. So I'll talk about today. So anyway, that's what I want to, Du Bois has turned out to be a pivotal figure in the account of Robinson um, with regard to racial capitalism. And Robinson claims actually, and I would suggest that this is not entirely accurate, that Du Bois actually left Marxism for the so-called black radical tradition. I don't think that Du Bois ever disowned his Marxist association. So that's relevant to our democratic Marxist project. The third session will be on decolonizing canons. And uh, I will have a distinctive view about the way that we could think about Du Bois in relationship to the existing canon in sociology. That will require me talking about what a canon is, a theory of canons, and how they change. Well, I won't say any more about that now. And finally, perhaps most controversially, I'm going to talk about black Marxism. I suspect that I may, in the next few days, decide not to think about it as black Marxism, but as anti colonial Marxism, but to bring the boys not in relationship to sociology, but in relationship 
to um, a series of Marxists, anti-colonial Marxists, but in particular, people like C.L.R. James, uh, Stuart Hall, out of the Commonwealth Crops, and um, Franz Fanon. And I'm going to specifically try and enter into a conversation between Fanon and Du Bois. So that will be the last session. All right. Okay. So I've got how much time? Uh, Half an hour? Mm. Three quarters? Three quarters. Three quarters. Great. Okay. In 1990, I was invited by, yes, Gladen Zamandi, who was the secretary of the Association of Sociologists. Oh, damn it. AFA. Association of Sociologists of Southern Africa. Is that right? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, to give an address, and this was the first time I'd come back since 1968 because of the boycott, against the boycotts, and I gave an address to us in Stellenbosch, and yeah, you were there, right? And I think we watched a football game together you because it was the World Cup. You back to you know, I back the right to. It was against. It was England versus Cameroon. Hmm. Yeah, remember in the back room. I didn't, I didn't dare go to the back room. I sat there watching it very quietly. Yes. That was an exciting game. Yes, anyway, that was 1990 So I was overwhelmed and in awe of the sociology that I saw there open up before me in the sessions that I watched and listened to. And I thought, gosh. This is a whole different sociology, the one I was accustomed to in the United States, and particularly in Berkeley, not particularly in Berkeley, but in the United States. And so I went back to Berkeley, inspired by this alternative, engaged sociology. Um, it was a sociology that was in the trenches of the anti-apartheid movement and the organization of labor, and it was at once engaged in the struggles, not all sociologists by any means, but many of the people who were at the AFTA meeting, um, engaged in those struggles, but at the same time reinvented sociology. And all sorts of new ideas were emerging. And Jackie and, and Eddie can test to that. Devon was there. I don't know who else was there. You weren't there, were you? Absolutely. No, you're too young. <laughs> so, all right. So I went back, and this was 1990, and I became chair of my department. They were really desperate. And <laughs> I thought, well, what can we, how can we brand ourselves? To use the word today. How can we brand ourselves? And I thought, well, they're also in Berkeley, but the Cubians, and there were lots of people who were, in fact, speaking to the world beyond the academy. So, relatively rare in the United States, as many of you may know, most sociologists spend their time writing papers for sociology journals that are read by three or four people if they're lucky. Now, there were people writing books, my colleagues are writing books, people like Ali Hoskow, Robert Lana, Robert Bella, these people may not be named to you, but they were big figures in sociology precisely because they projected their ideas into a wider arena. So I thought, okay, public sociology, but that idea of public sociology at first emerged in my head from my experiences in 1990. And then I developed a scheme, a scheme that Subsequently, have become a matter of great controversy. Let's see. Oh, by the way, I, this is the, oh, oh, this is this is my man. This is our man. Doesn't be before the place. This is about. I think this is at the um, World Race Congress in 1911. And he always wore 
very elegant clothes. He has usually gloves, sometimes walking suit, all of which he learns from his experience in Germany when he went to the university. And people argue that basically he didn't experience racism in Germany as he had done, of course, in the United States, but in Germany, the, the, the demarcation was the way you dressed, the way you looked, and he managed to convince many that, uh, that he was, in fact, an aristocrat. Anyway, that's, uh, that was just a footnote. And let's leave all that. So here is the uh, table that I concocted in about 92. Not, well, it was, it was after that. It was actually in the late 90s when I was trying to sort of project the idea of public sociology in the United States and where I became the president of the, of the National and International Sociological Associations. So look, I'm not going to deal with going into details, that's not my purpose here, but I thought that here was a model of thinking about sociology, there's public sociology here, and professional sociology, this was a very hyper-professionalized, a hyper-professionalized discipline in the United States. Um, critical sociology was critical of professional, but critical of the world too. And policy sociology was an engagement, an attempt to sort of change the world through institutional means. The public sociology was more an engagement with politics, put it very bluntly. And I thought that this was, this was a so very universal model. And I had the audacity to bring this model back in 2003, when Tina Ace uh, uh, asked me to give a talk at what was then a SAS. So, yeah. So that, that's what I was doing. I was showing this. So African sociology was an inspiration now for the world sociology, according to this table. But <coughs> some people, Took it on, made it serious. I think Jimmy Ancina said, said you know, I don't understand this fad for public sociology when he gave his address to the uh, to the SAS in 2006. And, and, and so, yeah, there were sort of beginnings of grumblings. Who's this guy? He takes our ideas and puts it in a US context, and then and this is fact. Well, yes, so grumbling. So a lot of grumbling. So I was actually so sort of reimposing sort of Western concepts on South African sociology, specifically South African contexts. Um, and others were saying, well, there's another concept, critical engagement concept. Associated first with Eddie Webster, but then with Swap, and then you can say more broadly with bits sociology and more broadly beyond. And finally, Coleman Holt and this is not here, um, and this Wagenhout and some I'm really uh my, they put together a book and it's here, it came out actually. Just last year, critical engagement with public sociology. And it's a collection of essays that is, in fact, a critique of public sociology from the standpoint of critical engagement. Yeah. Now, what is this critical engagement? I'm going to take a quote that is from actually Eddie's, one of Eddie's articles, and it's just a sentence. Um, a difficult combination of commitment to the goals of these movements to which one is allied, to which one supports, while being faithful to the evidence, data, and your own judgment and conscience. Critical engagement, engaging with movements, but at the same time holding, holding firm to a critical faculty that can see movement <laughs> Not necessarily as they see themselves, but at a distance. The critical engagement is the refusal, in a sense, to be spontaneously overwhelmed by the movement itself. That one should 
Well, and it's reminds me of Harold Wolfe's ideas. You start with the ideas, and he would say, you start with the ideas of the liberation struggle, the projects of the liberation struggle, the goals. You do your research, but you do your research in an independent way that may come into conflict with many of the strategies of that movement. And you did that in into somewhat hot water with the movement on many occasions. Anyway, that's the idea of critical engagement. And I want to, and I, I tell when you it's critical engagement is what I call organic public sociology. That is to say, an engagement with the world beyond, with publics, with movements, in an unmediated fashion, not sending ideas out and publishing them in newspapers and publishing them in social media, um, but actually <coughs> engaging on a face to face basis with, with publics. I thought that was what critical engagement was. But I've been thinking over the last year that I was pretty blind to the arguments that Carl and his colleagues were making in this book, Critical Engagement with Public Sociology. That is to say, that is to say that I think that US sociology is what I call an introverted discipline. If you look at all the debates that have been changed, if you look at all the debates about public sociology, it's about this table. And people who position themselves differently in this table engage in a critique of one another. It is, it is a debate and discussion that has been very internal indeed to the discipline. And I think that the sociology in South Africa particularly at that time, but still to this day, it not introverted, but extroverted, that sociology spontaneously thinks first and foremost about the world beyond. Extroverted, not in the way that Mutanji uses it, that is to say, that is to say, it is not that South African sociology is extroverted in the sense of being always tied to referring to Western sociology. I mean by extroverted as being engaging in the world beyond, beyond usually at a national level, but not only the national one beyond the academy. So I think, therefore, I think that critical engagement has a different significance than public sociology. That public sociology is a very American concept. It was organized and presented and conceptualized as in opposition to this hyper professionalized discipline sociology. Whereas this was not the concern of critical engagement, which was to directly transform the world beyond the academy as well as the academy. Yeah. Now, what the hell is this to do with W.B. Du Bois? Well, W.B. Du Bois is the exception that proves the rule. He was a sociologist who displayed, practiced critical engagement, not public sociology. That Du Bois was expelled, in a sense, from the academy left the academy and continued to engage beyond the academy with the issues of the day with a body of sociology in his mind that he himself developed over time. That he was so different from the professional sociology that was so tied into the academy, to the university. And I want to tell you today about the boys' critical engagement. And that is what I've got. Now I have got half an hour, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Now I'm going to basically the purpose of this little talk now is also to, 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 I must go behind here, right? That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I can't stand still, I'm afraid, particularly with a PowerPoint. All right, okay. I'm going to basically give you a talk of the life of Du Bois from the standpoint of critical engagement. 
He was brought up in Western Massachusetts, a place called Great Barrington, in a relatively in a white community, um, largely white community, single mother. He was clearly already an intellectual star at school, and the headmaster of the school, the church, and the mill owner's wife combined to sponsor him to go to Fisk University, which was in the South. He was Western Massachusetts and in the North. And Fisk University, as I said earlier, is a historically black university. And there he moved into a whole new context, fellow African-Americans, male and female at Fisk University, a whole new community, a whole new vision. He discovered what it means to be African-American, to be black in the United States. And of course, this is in the South. So he was there for three years. And he then realized his ambition, even when he was in high school, he said, I am going to Harvard. The boys had a pretty high opinion of himself. I believe quite justified. Um, but yes, he, it would be upsetting to several people in, in, future, in, in, in his future life. But anyway, he made it to Harvard and he took his first degree there. As still a second time, he had a BA. And then he decided to specialize in history. He was interested in philosophy, but they suggest, his, his teacher suggested William James in particular said that was not necessarily appropriate for him. Um, given that he was an African-American, history might be more, more pertinent. There was no sociology there. And so he, um, he, he continued um, his PhD in history. And he wrote, a, I think, should become increasingly famous, but at this point is not famous, a book called um, The Suppression of the Slave Trade in the United States. How the slave trade actually diminished over time. Um, anyway, he, he left for two years to go to the University of Berlin in those years. Um, to be really educated meant you had to be at a German university. And so he went to the University of Berlin, where he came in contact with the Social Democratic Party, but also with this emergent discipline of sociology. Um, and he there became converted to sociology. He did meet Max Weber there, but they hardly knew one another. One of the myths is that Max Weber was his teacher. If you look at their relationship between the two, it looks more like that, that, that Du Bois was the teacher of Max Weber. But anyway, we'll not go down that road. Um, so he comes back. He comes back in 1894 to the United States, African-American. Not a hope of getting a job. Because he, not only was he African-American, he didn't have a pedigree. Um, of, of sociology, not a hope of getting a job in a, in a major department, but took a job at Wilberforce University um, in Ohio, which was again a historically black university. And he was forced there to teach classics, which he had a book learned in Fisk. So there he was, he was miserable there. Um, the only alleviating factor was that he, 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 he found and just, uh, found a uh, a candidate for um, marriage, and he was one of his students, and which he describes in rather Victorian way. Um, uh, and, uh, and he leaves, and he leaves for a lowly assistant research position at the University of Pennsylvania, where he does the research, is hired to do the research of what became the famous book, The Philadelphia Negro published in 1899. So let's go over here. Now, I'm, I'm there are going to be four phases of his life. The first phase is what I'm going to call scholar denied. I use that expression after a book that came out in, in, 1916, in 2016 by uh, Alden Morris, a book called Scholar Denied, which is a book about the early Du Bois and how he has to be recognized as the founder of US sociology because basically the work that he would do um, when he goes to the University of Atlanta after, um, after, the, after writing The Philadelphia Negro um, 
he, he, the, the, the work he does there in the Atlanta, what is now called the Atlanta and School of Sociology, um, antedated the so-called Chicago School by 20 years. The day he founded US sociology is no real significant, in my view, achievement. Um, but we have to really think about Du Bois is in relationship to the canonical thinkers of Mark Weber Dirk. And nobody reads Robert Park today in, in, in sociology. Uh, excuse me. Um, but anyway, scholars now it is all about the way he was not able to actually pursue an academic career. He had written the Philadelphia Negro, a canonical case study of urban America, with a study of the Seventh Ward where African Americans were the entire population in Philadelphia. Um, but the, the Seventh Ward was, there were African Americans outside the Seventh Ward. The Seventh Ward was entirely African American. And he does an amazing study of the life of African Americans, their education, their occupations, their leisure existence, crime and poverty. And what is perhaps quite significant, to make more, make, make, make more significant tomorrow, is he, 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 he developed a stratification system uh, of which the top was the elite African-Americans, which he would call the talented tenth. And then there was the stable working class, the unstable working class, and the submerged tenth. Those were his four stratas. And what he was trying to do was to convince, to convince whites that, yes, they should take seriously at least the elite, if not the all, the entire African American population, that they should treat African Americans as humans. And that was the project. He was trying to show that actually African Americans, which was quite radical for the time, respond to the social conditions of their time, that African Americans respond to the Recent history of slavery, which had only ended in 1865 in principle, um, and also to the to the to the transition African Americans had to make um, when they came to Philadelphia, as well as the discrimination they faced. But these were responses that can that were human responses. They were not, in a sense, peculiarly peculiar to any racial group. Anyway, so he writes the Philadelphia Negro, um, and at, he goes there to the University of Atlanta, where he gets a real job, another uh, historically black university, and there he does build the Atlanta School of Sociology. But then he realizes this science that he so brilliantly for the time, given the resources he had, he did the study in, in the seventh world all by himself, interviewing in one year 2,500 um, people. Um, so he, <laughs> he's, he's also beginning. As more studies come out of the University of Atlanta, he becomes more skeptical about the capacity of science to actually influence science. Yeah. And so he changes the way he writes, the register. And The Souls of Black Folk is probably the most famous book that he wrote, in the 1903 collection of essays. Some of you may know of the concepts, if not have you read the book. It starts out with the idea of double consciousness. Um, there are essays about segregation in the rural areas. This is largely about rural Georgia and rural Tennessee. Um, talks about, writes about, very movingly, about the sharecropping system that existed after Reconstruction, and the Jim Crow system of the South. The, what he calls the ugly side of progress. He writes about the passing of his firstborn. He's still appealing, he's still appealing to whites, still appealing to whites to take the lines of African Americans seriously. But he's doing it in another register. 
He's with he's literally essence. Yeah. So is a black folk is somewhat a critique of the Philadelphia Negro. Philadelphia Negro, she's accepted the sort of American ideology, the importance of the work ethic. But now in the Souls of Black Folk, he's talking about double consciousness. He's talking about the way that there is a there is, yes, indeed, the a gaze of whites, but that is a gaze that really represents the oppression of American ideology and its and its and its and its, and its principles. Yeah. All right. Scholar denied. So 1903. Writes the souls of black folk, and then begins his political activity. One of the essays, one of the most memorable essays in the souls of black folk, is the critique of Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington, sizing up the times, makes that classic compromise, which is to say, we will not participate in demands for civil rights and political freedom, political rights. But in exchange, we want to actually advance economically. And we want to have resources, institutions that will train African Americans for industrial jobs. Du Bois says, no, you cannot give up the pursuit of political rights and civil rights. That to do so, would mean the continuity of the racism of segregation. We have to continue to fight. And this 1903 begins his more active political participation. First in the Niagara movement, a collection of African Americans um, who begin to think about the development of a social movement. It eventually becomes the National Association of Fair Person of Color People in 1910. Du Bois is one of the co-founders, and he becomes, he becomes um, the editor of its magazine, The Crisis. Yeah. So this is the first period. Now, this is the period in which he wants to be a sociologist. That's all he wants to be, he claims. But it's not possible. The racism makes it impossible for him to establish his position in prestigious elite universities to which he genuinely belonged. And he was also worried about, well, what do universities do? I mean, they're not really going to actually lead to the transformation of the world, particularly the racial order which saturated the world life in the South. He was becoming much too radical for the university. And so he leaves the university, joins the NAACP, becomes the editor of crisis. And we move on to Scholar Unbound. Good. Scholar Unbound. Well, all right, he leaves. And now he thinks it's really futile to really take seriously the project of changing the minds of whites. So he begins to address fellow African Americans. That is what the Crisis Magazine is all about, to actually begin to articulate an understanding of who African Americans are, where they fit in the world, and their history. It's an extraordinary magazine that comes out six times a year. For 24 years, he edits it. When he begins Booker T. Washington, is still the leading figure, the leading African-American figure, politician, intellectual. But when Booker T. Washington dies in 1915, that position is taken over, essentially, by Yes, W. E. B. Du Bois. So, in addressing African Americans, not only is he editing the magazine, The Crisis, he also writes 
a biography of John Brown in 1909. John Brown was a white, devoted method, a Christian who became a martyr by organizing an insurrection at Harper's Ferry, an insurrection against the racial order. It was bound to fail, but it was, as people now say, a sort of dress rehearsal for the Civil War. That was in 1859. Du Bois writes a biography of John Brown, in a sense, in underlining the importance of politically engaged action. And he says, one of his mantra in that book is the Christ, the cost of repression is greater than the price of liberation. Yes, engaging in liberation of custody, but it's even it less costly than the continuity of racial oppression. Yeah. So he also writes another uh, book in 1915 called The Neighbor. And that book. Um, is his first serious attempt at understanding the history of African Americans, particularly the construction of the slave trade. Um, and so, again, he's trying to give some sort of sense of identity and a sense of the incredible oppression that they African Americans had faced and trying to also demonstrate how far they had come even after the end of slavery um, with this end of the Civil War. But the book that really marks the radical shift is the book Dark Water, my favorite book. Very thin selections of essays. This is an auto critique of the souls of black folk. In this book, two essays in some way stand out. The first is the essay called The Souls of White Folk. And, you know, he's not saying now to African Americans, look, or he's not saying, he's not now addressing whites, he's not now addressing whites, look, please treat. African Americans as humans. He's now saying to African Americans, these whites are inhuman. And not only do they oppress blacks inhumanely, but they oppress each other. And here he's talking about World War I. For the boys in this essay, World War I is a struggle, a brutal struggle amongst European powers for control of what? Of the colonized world, in particular Africa. This antedates Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, which makes a similar sort of argument about the course of World War I. So, that is, in that book, he's talking less about African Americans and their so called pathologies but now more about whites and the ideology of white supremacy and the ideology that whites have that they own the world. And in that essay, in that one essay, he distinguishes crucially two types of imperialism, the one based on the slave trade and the second one that is based on the, after the end of the slave trade, the colonization of, of Africa and other parts of the world, um, the movement of capital to those parts. Yeah, all right. Um, the other essay, and there are about 10 essays, 12 essays in this book. The other very dramatic essay is an essay called of work and wealth, a very undramatic title, but it is about the race riots of East St. Louis. And here he 
clarifies, elaborates an idea he had had for some time of what we would now call a segregated labor market, white capital, white labor, and black labor. And he describes the changing conditions during the First World War in St. Louis, East St. Louis, that give rise to influx of ever more African Americans from the South, cheap labor, threatening, threatening um, whites, privileges, generating the race riot at East St. Louis. But he ends that essay saying that socialism is the solution. And preaching of socialism could come from the German ideology, or it could come from the, the passage in the volume three of Capital, you know, about the realm of necessity and the realm of freedom, and how the realm of freedom has to expand and the realm of necessity has to contract, the length of the working day has to contract. He's got a very utopian, imaginary utopian vision of what this socialism might entail. But he says, this socialism that is pursued by socialists will never be realized until what? Until the socialists of the time, and this is 1920 when the socialists were relatively strong, until the socialists take what seriously? They take race seriously. You cannot postpone the race question. But he has in his mind and this is the first time he talks now seriously about capitalism and imperialism, that we have to go beyond those to a socialist. A socialist is emancipated too. Yeah. All right. So, I'm going to move on to number three. Scholar radicalized. Now, he already seems to be radical compared with many of his contemporaries. But his socialism, as I say, is an imaginary utopia. And he's now going to shift. What happens is, to cut a long story short, he goes to the Soviet Union in 1928. Two months. Until then, in all his editorials, in the crisis, he's always agnostic about the significance and viability of Soviet communism. Um, he's always been suspicious of violence and violent social movements. He goes to the Soviet Union and he comes back and he says, if what I have seen is Bolshevism, if what I have heard is Bolshevism, and I am bullshit. <laughs> so, what had he seen? He had seen the attempt, the attempt to eradicate poverty. He had seen what appeared to him a society that was not, was not suffused with racism. In fact, a society that was already beginning to develop anti-colonial theses. Um, so he, he begins to, he begins to think, well, why did none of my teachers teach me Marx? He says, Marx this. They didn't know Marx. At Harvard, they made fun of Marx. In Germany, even in Germany, you know, Marx was not taken seriously in the lectures. He blames his teachers for being ignorant. And then he now begins to realize to only, and no, this is, shall we say 1928, how old is he? He's 60 years old, right? No chicken, but for the boys, he's still a chicken. So he, he, he absorbs, writes, reads about Marx, asks his friends what he should be reading. And as he becomes more radical, 
He becomes ever more alienated from the NAACP. After all, don't forget, he's a key member of the NAACP. He is the editor of this magazine. But in his editorials and his reporting, he's becoming ever more alienated from the integrationist, legalistic approaches of the NAACP. And when the New Deal comes along, the Depression comes along, the Crisis magazine, from being such a successful organ, becomes, enters into some sort of financial crisis, and he begins to lose control of the magazine. And he, some would say fired, he's fired from the crisis, others would say he resigns, but he leaves anyhow. He leaves in 1930, 30, Three, he basically resigns from the crisis magazine. He leaves the NAACP and he rejoins the University of Atlanta at the invitation of his friend John Hope. That's 1933-34. Now, since his discovery of Marx, he reconstructs his understanding of the period of reconstruction. And he had been writing a lot about reconstruction from the early 1900s. But now he talks about the period of reconstruction that is after the Civil War in clearly Marxist terms. The fifth chapter is called The Black Worker. And in that chapter, he describes the way that slavery, after independence of 1776, after the abolition of slave trade, becomes intensified in the United States. Why? Because it is meeting the demand for what? For cotton from the Industrial Revolution in England. So he's already developing a world perspective of what is happening in the United States. In the second chapter entitled The White Worker, he talks about the white worker in the North and the white worker in the South, the South where there is slavery, I have been the slavery, um, and the North where there were, there were emancipated African Americans. He talked about how whites had an interest that was antagonistic to blacks, but not necessarily so. He showed how actually some immigrants from Europe come with a very anti race, anti slavery perspective and abolitionist perspective. But when push comes to shove, the white workers engage in struggle for their own interests vis a vis capital in the North. And in the South, the white workers, again, potentially could be in alliance with black workers, but actually are severed from the enslaved population. The next chapter is called The Planter. And that's an extraordinarily interesting chapter, quite controversial. He, really, he vacillates between the planter being some sort of feudal aristocrat Sort of a mode of production other than capitalist, uh, vacillates between that position and the position that the planter is a degenerate capitalist who doesn't understand the profit motive and who doesn't reorganize production as any good capitalist would do when they face competition from others. So it was a mode of production or a form of production that would have to go. But what was significant about this form of production, as others have always argued, is that the slave system, the slave system expands not by transforming production, but by expanding geographically and incorporating ever more greater population. And it is that, it is that pressure to expand that is for Du Bois the real source of the Civil War. The southern planters want to expand geographically into areas that northern capitalists want claim to be their own for capitalism. 
So that is chapter three. Chapter four, and I'm doing a quick summary. This book's 700 pages. Dead stuff. I don't know how many people actually read it from cover to cover. I tried. So, chapter four is called The General Strike. The General Strike. Well, what is the General Strike? The General Strike, as we know, is a strike of proletarians, of the proletariat. He is likening the enslaved to workers, to wage laborers, that they are workers too. But what is the general strike? The general strike is the defection of the enslaved from the plantations when the northern armies are coming close by. They risk life and limb to join those northern armies. Now, I'm not talking with, we got, we're dealing with four million enslaved. Half a million in the end are defected. But half a million is a huge number, particularly when the northern armies are becoming ever more demoralized as it becomes ever more clear that to the soldiers, the troops, that actually the war is not the, the unity of the United States, but it is seemingly connected to the end of slavery. So the defection, Du Bois argues, the defection of the enslaved actually makes it possible, becomes the turning point in the war. In the beginning, the Northern armies will not accept African Americans, will not accept the enslaved. Uh, but slowly but surely, they realize that's their only possibility of winning. And so Du Bois argues, that the African Americans, the enslaved, actually made it possible for the North, for the North to win the Civil War. The enslaved were making history of themselves for themselves, and sports with a powerful mission, with great courage against the South, the Southern Armies. And of course, the Southern Armies were losing. A lot of the resources, so the idea was that the southern, that the southern armies were made up of whites and the, 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 the supplies and the food was being produced still on the plantations. That was just assumed by the southern army. But as defection became important, half a million defected, this affected the supplies of the southern armies, as well as aggrandizing the power of the other armies. Yeah. Oops. Yes. Okie dokie, all right. That's, well, okay, that's, that's the, 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 the story goes on. Let me move more quickly now. The story goes on in the 700 page book to um, talk about reconstruction itself in these very different states in the South and the support of the Freedmen's Bureau, which is a sort of government from the North with the support of the military. And, um, the reconstruction process is always characterized at that time as a corrupt parent, the biggest catastrophe that, 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 that the United States had ever faced was the, was, was the allowing African Americans to begin to have some power with the amendments of the 13th, 14th, and 15th from the Constitution. And so Du Bois turns upside down the very vision of reconstruction, showing in fact that this was the movement of democracy. The increased political rights, political representation for African Americans, and indeed for poor whites, the expansion of education and welfare, that these things were actually taking place. One thing that didn't take place was the redistribution of land, which the boys argued was essential for a true democracy to develop. But 19, in 1876, in 1876, the North withdraws the army, as a result of a fiasco election in which private capital gets its way and Du Bois has a chapter, the counter-revolution of property, which slavery is over. And so now Northern capital is less interested in advancing democracy in the South. And Du Bois argues this would have been a much more radical democracy than existed in the United States at that time in the North. 
And so reconstruction ends and enter Jim Crow. And the very famous line in the chapter the return, the return to, to, to slavery, so the new form of sharecropping, and it has it's made up as a repressive labor system. He talks about the public and private wage for whites, the public and the public, sorry, the public and psychological wage for whites. The, Whites have access in this post reconstruction period to all sorts of resources, labor system, welfare system, education denied to blacks, and they also have a psychology of dominating blacks. So that's that very thick book. And I just want to say that Du Bois was writing this in 1935, well, probably from about 1930 to 1935, and he had in mind, well, what sort of real utopia might exist now? That there was a real utopia then, what he called, he called Reconstruction, a splendid, a splendid failure. Um, now he wants to look for an alternative one, and this is perhaps relevant to Yubish, um, that he wants to think about a, what he calls a cooperative government. He sees in his Zask of Dawn, which is his third autobiography, he sees that racism is much deeper than he had imagined. And so thinks that perhaps we should take segregation as given and use it to organize an, an economy for African Americans, almost like a planned socialist system. He calls it a cooperative commonwealth. And he writes a famous essay in 1953 entitled um, uh, African nation within a nation, which is has certain parallels to the, what the Communist Party was saying at a similar time. All right, so he's therefore again imagining alternatives all the time. These are, in a sense, real utopias rather than the imaginary utopias of, of the dark water. And finally, quick, can we just see what happens? This is now scholar persecuted. Yeah, jeepers. Then it's difficult to time these things. Okay. Well, what happens is, you know, he's at the University of Atlanta having left, having left um, NAACP. But then Hope, his friend who was president, disappears and dies. And he becomes um, ever more uh, alienated from the university. And the university wants to dump him. They dump him because he's getting too old. Uh, and goes back to the NAACP in 1944, and um, as you know, as a as a as an independent re as a, a researcher, and particularly important because with the coming of the end of the war, they needed the NAACP needed somebody with Du Bois's um, extraordinary knowledge of different parts of the world, and they thought, well, you know, it's basically. We've got to wither away in this position. He's going to cause us no problems as he had before. Well, he does. <laughs> he does. Um, in 1945, he writes Common Democracy, which is a book that argues that you, he's basically seizing the opportunity of the Second World War to actually expand the possibilities of democracy and decolonization, and particularly focused on the creation of the UN. And he says, you won't have not democracy, you will not have democracy in the United States. You will have not democracy anywhere in the world until you have democracy everywhere in the world. You have to have democracy in the Earth well, in the colonized territories. And then he writes another book, World of Africa, which is an elaboration of the arguments he had made in Darkwater, namely this two, this two stages of, of an imperialism, focusing on a magnificent account, which I cannot talk about here, a magnificent account of, 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 of particularly of the first stage and the second stage of imperialism through the idea of commodity secondism. Well, I don't know whether he's read Marxist. But, but he's absorbed, but, but he's a, such a beautiful account of, he has a story of 
aristocratic way of playing the piano with the ivory keys. And then goes into where those ivory keys come from. And so production and consumption are separated geographically. And so nobody thinks about what goes on in the production of ivory. Yeah. And he also talks then about the elephant's tusks and talks about elephants as, as part of human. And so that's a whole fascinating account of imperialism. Ah, all right, so now you go. Boom. Okay, so now 47, that's the world in Africa. And then he gets into trouble. He starts and getting engaged in peace movement after 1945. The bombing of the Russian in the and he becomes a big figure in that peace movement and organizing rallies, going to conferences in Paris, even Soviet Union. And this politics is becoming increasingly unacceptable to the United States state. And so he's indicted by the US state. State Department as an undeclared agent of a foreign principle, presumed to be the Soviet Union. And so there is a trial that was 50, a trial for two, 50, 51. And um, he must have huge support, most of it actually coming from outside the United States, since many African Americans have become increasingly suspicious of his very strong left-wing move. And he, the court, the case is actually thrown out by the judge because the person who was to turn state witness um, was a fraudulent character. So he's let off, but he loses his passport. He can't travel for the next 10 years. 1958, Supreme Court says he can have his passport back. Uh, it was illegally appropriated from him. He travels a victory tour almost like around the next round of work to China and to Russia and Soviet Union, where red carpets are put out and what he makes uh, condemned to lectures on the nature of US imperialism, racism in the United States. And then he returns to the United States in 1960 and realizes the position there is very precarious. So he accepts the invitation of Kumkuma to, um, to, to take up exile in Ghana, where he lives for the last two years of his life, um, working on the encyclopedia of the colored peoples of the world. And he dies in 63, somewhat. That's on the eve, interestingly enough, on the eve of the uh, Civil Rights March on Washington. Um, when Martin Luther King has his, makes his speech about the African, in uh, fact, the American home. Um, and then, that's, and then he's, he, he dies in somewhat of obscurity. And only recently have we now recovered this extraordinary figure. And I haven't even touched really beyond, beyond the most superficial account of his life. And I hope to actually talk more about certain facets of it that might be of interest here um, and in such an expression. So, uh, okay. Okay, so that's all right. I had another slide on critical engagement, but I'll leave that. I had a two by two for everybody. <laughs> All right, I'll promote you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this story concludes explain explanatory science with a global perspective on race, class, and capitalism. So, reflexive science that embarks from the lived experience of self or others, reconstructs theory, 
So the boys always begin to account um, with regard to the lived experience of himself or um, of, of others. Um, a moral science always founded on a certain set of moral values and um, also has always keeps in mind visions of the alternative. That is what I think critical engagement um, means to the boys when they look at his look at his writings and um, well, you can tell me whether you think that is what critical engagement means here in South Africa. No, I, think so. I think we're all a bit stunned and so impressed with this light and your communication about it. So what about this uh, reflexive science? You've done that as well as anyone, which is in, I suppose, some of our terminology, praxis of epistemology, which if you're fighting for justice, you're learning more about structured power systems, where they're weak, where they're strong. Um, and that seemed to be part of your argument in this uh, evolution. So I was wondering if you, if you kind of took that into any concrete form. I could see, not knowing the boys, but reading through Ben Magdalene, how he pressed who had been in exile. And he, our greatest South African sociologist of the next generation, to um, to reflect on fighting white power. And from Magdalene, it was the fight with liberals, CLA and all the others that he had in any given them. Yeah, this is subsequent work here was so important on uh, linking a racial capitalism to the dynamism of the historic process, which, which transcended, you know, our 70s rather than the world. Well, was there, uh, not so much with Ben, but the respect he had for the boys, Francis, was there a production of knowledge there that we should be elevating in our work in South African social science, uh, instead of being so fearful of activists? And when some of the universities I've been in, including this one, not just fearful, they run in the other direction. I'm not the comrades in the house, but the people who handle PhD committee are chairing. And when that happens, you really know you're sticking it quite close to the bone. Yeah, I think, well, that is the message of the book. Right? But if you look just at his autobiographies, he is continually reconstructing his understanding of the world based on his engagement with the book in the intermediate period. So it's sold that that book is completely different from. Dark water is again different from just from Jordan, and then he writes a fine autobiography. And you can see how he's learned it's very clear in just the talk that his struggles really make it obvious that you cannot get rid of racism by doing good science. I mean, it may help, but you need to engage in a much more serious activism. But he's learning that's a reflexive moment. He's very, he's continuing to read, to reconstruct his own early life and, and where he comes from. So yeah, I think that's a lesson. And the only other person who I think of in this term is Simone de Beauvoir. She also writes a lot about her life and how she develops her ideas. But nowhere near as systematically in my view as poetry. Before you read it, you can introduce yourself. I'm Abhinash, and I teach at the end of the city. So I could do what is wonderful. Um, I would say that you know um, our interaction with the web kind of um, a little longer because uh, in India in particular, um, because uh, the work was introduced to the Indian scholarship by Dr. Kiran and and a very common similarity between what we were just talking about uh, um, in terms of the, uh, the reconstruction. Is and I'm quoting the from Baker and said the consistency is the virtue of mass. Sorry? Consistency is the virtue of mass. So this is the word, uh, this is the uh, this is the kind of uh, you know when he was writing about so reconstruction and rethinking about the life that is about the organic sort of academic that we do. Um, what I am um, kind of um, interested in to because I, I have also heard your um, previous lecture on the word. Uh, in 2021, uh, um, you know, uh, to some sense. Uh, and I'm not sure um, uh, you would like to answer it now, but I think it's important to me to 
Zago in terms of understanding, because I also want to say that I'm also critically engaged in the ethnographic work of world. Uh, my current project, which I'm working on, is <laughs> the, the idea of, uh, and this is connected to the other project which I have got special concern about decoloniality. And in that particular perspective, I think it is very important to um, uh, go far and particularly engage with the terms given by the government. And one of the very important terms which is given is wage. And I'm trying to theorize wage as violence. So I'm currently working on the theory of wage violence, where your work becomes a very important uh, sort of an engagement. So in that context, I want to flag it now so that I can kind of uh, uh, see through you uh, over, over the last four lectures. Do you reconsider after reading the boy? As in your other lecture, you have said that you discovered the boy in 2003 and 4 when uh, you did that, uh, uh, when you were the president of the Socialist Association and you had this fantastic plenary session on the boy, and that was great. Uh, so uh, after, uh, we, because you know, when I was reading your art, you know, writing in 2012, which is based on your last presentation in this hall, your conversation with both, um, conversation with you, both, of both, yeah. yes, uh -huh. yeah. So uh, where you try to distance yourself from the theory of misrepetition, and you propose the theory of mystification. Um, uh, I want to understand whether you have reconsidered or reformulated your position of mystification or you're still standing with the idea of mystification. Okay. <coughs> yeah, but I, we can have a little conversation about that. Yes. I'm very happy to do that. I'm a free man. Um, um, I'm hoping you are too. Um, but I do want to say something about India and Du Bois. Fascinating. You say that Ambedkar introduced Du Bois to India. Let me look at it from the standpoint of Du Bois. Du Bois was in, was in love with Nehru and Gandhi. They, he put them on a pedestal. He had very little communication um, with them, um, but he did have stuff. Um, and he said that 1947 was the greatest year in the history of humanity, one of his opening. Uh... And in India, like yourself, people associate Du Bois with Ambedkar. Why? Because Ambedkar was anti caste and he was at a running feud with, with, with Gandhi and was very critical of the whole development of post coloniality in India. And Ambedkar was, 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 was focused on the issue of cuts. And of course, Du Bois was in the United States. He talks about the South, a racism as a color cuts. So everybody thinks, ah, he must be Ambedkarite. No, he wasn't. What's going on here? Why has Du Bois got this incredible infatuation with? Gandhi and Nehru. My claim is that Du Bois has three positionalities black, middle class, professional, and is part of an imperial country. And that imperialism of which he is ensconced comes out in different ways. And one of the ways is he's looking around the world for anti imperial movements. And that's what independence in India stands for for him anti-imperial, anti-US. That's what Japanese fascism stood for. That's what China stood for. That's what the Soviet Union stood for. That's what, I don't know, a more complicated way, Brazil, where he endorsed the idea of racial democracy. Well, there he's looking for an alternative to the segregation in the South and sees where miscegenation can be a sort of solution. But we have to think of Du Bois as located in the United States and having a vision of the world based on that position. Sometimes he is he's quite condescending towards Africa in the 1920s as a sort of paternalistic, that we African-Americans will come and say, save Africans in Africa. 
We are educated professionals. At other times, he sees, he sees, he sees the independence movements as anti-imperial. So the two sides of the two consciousnesses associated with his imperial positionality. So it's actually the story about India is a fascinating one. As it is, you know, his relationship to Israel endorses Israel. Ah, oh, yeah, when when Israel is created, Palestinians don't exist for him. He's un unaware of the, uh, of, of, of the of the war of, of, that is going on. Changes his mind in 1956 with Suez. And then he recognizes it. He, so he changes his mind, which is part of this engagement. And he changes his mind and infuriates people that it, it's his own development, political development. And he sometimes brings people along and often not. But anyway, the Indian story is a fascinating one. He only had one correspondence with Ambedkar, one short letter. And so I'm, I'm, I'm always mystified why people are, well, I'm not mystified, I, I, I I, I, it, it is, it is a, an erroneous conclusion to draw that Du Bois and Ambedkar should be seen as a pair. Carl, did you have your hand up? That's an extraordinary history. I mean, this is a simple observation, and I'm wondering if you could speak to it. And maybe think it's um, in that you are giving us a kind of um, a, more sociological imagination through an individual thinker. And what's striking in that history is that we don't, and you've just said enough, he's had very sort of tangential relations to other people. You don't have a sense of his comradely engagement. You don't, and I think of, you know, uh, biographical writings on C.L.R. James, or even all, you know, the recent, all the recent stuff that's come out on Stuart Hall, a much more sort of embedded sense of that individual in comradely networks, in relationships, in all sorts of, you know, sort of other kinds of relations. And I wonder if you could talk about how you are presenting him as this individual thinker. Yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. Now, there have been many biographies of Du Bois, many, many, many. And David Levering Lewis is the most famous two volume Poets of Brighton. And you, you get this, this was, he was not deeply involved in, he was a public figure, public intellectual, editor of a crisis magazine, definitely working with colleagues, but he was not sort of, he was not Martin Luther King. He, he he had a sort of elitist propensity from the beginning. I mean, the talented tent was always linked to his idea that somehow the those who were well educated would be the ones who would lead African American population. He sort of shifted when he discovered later on that that talented tent were not actually with his project of socialism, and then start talking about the guiding hundred. Um, but so he begins to understand there should be a class analysis of the talented tent. But he's he's a scholar. That's why I do uh, everywhere is a scholar, scholar, scholar. Yeah, he's a scholar. And and so you know he's, he's a classicist. And you know, he, he's not one to actually reject Western civilization. He, 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 he's he's steeped in Western civilization. And so that's the difference between Marcus Garvey and W.B. Boys. Garvey had this huge popular support. And Du Bois just made fun of him all the time. Because Du Bois was, didn't have a huge sort of popular support in a political movement. So I think, I think if, you know, if you read the biographies, but I don't think it's just my construction, but part of the problem is that I guess I have for now it's Go through a long history, but I just focus. I think, mean, but, but your 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 observation is about him, not just about the way I construct the talk. And he dies alone. And so his projects were intellectual. He always had faith that the intellect and education was important. Warren, thanks very much, Michael. Wonderful presentation. Uh, does he ever change his mind about the Bolsheviks? What happens to his Marxism? Um, it's 
um, quite well known that during his NAACP years, um, he knew at least of revolutionary syndicalism in his plays of the IWW, were amazingly organizing across the color line and across the national immigrant line as well at the various, in the various industrial centers of the United States at the time. Um, does he critically engage the Soviet state um, after that famous declaration in 1958? Can I, can I jump on the mind? Okay, go ahead. Uh, so that popped into my mind, critical engagement as he accepts the Soviet Union, but as he critically engaged with the Soviet Union. And then you mentioned, of course, you joined the Communist Party. Which Communist Party? Sorry. The United States. Right. So prior to that, what was his relationship? You said you want to join the Empire. What was his relationship with the people before? Yeah. yeah. These are all very historical questions. And let me answer Soviet Union. 1950, he writes an amazing book. Never published. All his friends said, don't publish. This was a comparison. It was called Russia uh, and America. An interpretation. I think, I think he put an interpretation as a sort of subtitle. This was a, yeah, it was a glorification of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the Soviet Union. Taking literally what was said in the Constitution of the Soviet Union. And how democracy was supposed to work on a factory level and sort of feed upwards and then generate a plan. So a beautiful rendition of what the Soviet Union wanted everybody to believe. Um, and of course, the United States, well, that was a monopoly capitalism for him at the time. Um, and so it's a you know, it's a book that was never published. Why? One of the reasons that was interesting in that book is that it's a, it's a systematic critique. Systematic is not systematic. It's, 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 it's a vituperative critique of Trotsky. Trotsky is an agent of the United States because Trotsky is anti-Stalin. It's Trotsky is trying to bring down the Soviet Union. So, not very critical of the Soviet Union. He goes to China in 1958. China is a great leap forward. Disastrous time. No mention of that in any of his speeches. That he so this is this is his anti-imperialist move. It's a political move. And yeah, you wonder how can he write the book Black Reconstruction and still have this extraordinarily uncritical, simple-minded view of the Soviet Union. Fascinating. What's going on here? So we and, and Robson is another character, it's similar. And, and Langston Hughes is another. They, they, there's a sort of love relationship between the Soviet Union and African Americans. Anyway, so I think how does one there are so many paradoxes about this guy, it's difficult to know what to do with them. But it's that's that's the greatness of Du Bois that he generates all these puzzles. And so, yeah, uh, whether one can reduce this to a political maneuver, whether he was genuinely unaware, it's difficult for me to believe that he was genuinely aware of the downside of the Soviet Union. Um, but anyway, you've got to remember, he's coming from racist United States. He's brought up in the period of Jim Crow. So much of the world that is absent of him, and he's a, he, he feels he himself is this, uh, Part of the talented ten. If anybody should be recognized, he should be recognized. But no, he's not recognized. And then loses support from his fellow African Americans. I think psychologically, what can begin to put together a picture about the appeal of the Soviet Union. But yeah, blind spot. Good theory has blind spots, and we have to struggle with blind spots. So I'll have to say that next week. All right, anyway, that's not I can go on about it, but that's the communist part is complicated. He, yeah, he, he was endorsed the Soviet Union. But when it came to the US Communist Party, 
he kept his distance. Always kept his distance. Particularly in the 1930s, when the Communist Party was becoming quite strong, he saw this, the Communist Party as using African Americans as shot troops in the classroom. And in the famous Scottsboro Boys case, 1930, three or four, um, who were charged with raping two white women. And the Cumberland Party comes in, takes, and, and, and the boys is still sort of had a line from the NAACP, takes over the whole case and pushes the NAACP aside. And it, it was this strategy, the uh, sort of a vanguardist strategy that he was very suspicious of. So that's another, another peculiarity, interesting. All these stories and paradoxes have to be understood in their political, in their political, economic, historical context. But yes, he was always, always uh, kept his distance. Though in the 1950s, when he no longer could travel the world, when he had no passport, Shirley Gray, his second wife, um, she was very close to the Communist Party, and so he became much closer to members of the Communist Party. And would defend them in the McCarthy trials on those who accused of being communists. So, yeah, another complicated story. And, and, and eventually, it is the communist youth that actually persuades him that he should actually take the Communist Party more seriously. I think the final act is just basically thumbing his nose at the US state. Screw you, I'm off the Ghana. Um, and he said, when he, when he, when he, when he receives, he, 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 he applies to, to become a member and then is accepted and then, and then, then, and then in this whole process says, you know, I can't do this. I can't rewrite everything that I have done. And some parts, like John Brown, have a whole new press that is, is reconstructed in the light of his, 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 his conversion to Marxism. A particular form of Marxism, um, but uh, yeah, it's a fascinating story. So there's going to be two final ones: yourself and then Carl. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. My name is Zach. I'm a student So this is kind of the Du Bois um, revival, and it's interesting to see where this happens. Where particularly as a success with his own. Um, my question on this kind of lack of critical engagement with popular movements kind of got scooped in the contrast with Barbie also was there. So I'm wondering if, if that's a model for critical engagement, like what does that tell us about critical engagement as a scholarly practice versus a different model of intellectuals and things like Gramsci, the organic intellectual. Um, and it's, it's not to take it towards, I, I wrote this concept, but I find it very useful, but would he then kind of almost fit not exactly in something like a professional sociology to critique, given that he's not <laughs> much of his life a professional sociologist, but he is kind of engaged in ultimately a very intellectual practice that's not always very well articulated in the kind of tense conversation. Yeah, uh, uh, we uh, yeah so um, I. I I think this is a really interesting study, study of critical engagement. <laughs> but I think that's this last question of the course of other critical engagement, so the China baby, is in some ways a, well, I suppose the first point to make is like critical, critical engagement is a spectrum, ranging from those who are like deeply embedded in to those who have more critical attachment. So that's the first point, uh, rather than having one perfect model. But the second is that um, I suppose the stance of political engagement entails, because of its political commitments, almost necessarily or inevitably, it entails blind spots towards certain aspects. Uh, certain aspects. In a way, it's a kind of, it's the, the, all of our engagements are partial, they're all provisional. They're all contribution. Wherever we stand, the critical engagement, this is one of the kind of danger 
So if you want to look at swap, you could say as some have that swap was over close, over identified to you. I couldn't see some of the stuff that was there and then emerged in its native kind of, um, I don't know, its native, uh, not collapse, but uh, kind of rockets. So, you know, this, these are the, this is the downside of that complication, I think. But I think you can, you can you know, reflect on that as being an aspect of an element in why. Uh, and, and another interesting thing about it, actually, that that moment that the boys get, gets involved in the Soviet Union. And then, of course, Russia, I mean, South African communists. And Kubele, uh, the early secretary of the United States, also visiting the Soviet Union. And we're also saying, I've seen the future of the And so, I mean, it's something to do with the experience of extreme alienation from this society. Of where the slaves in the US or you know, the black press can dominate the South Africa. But this, this office is an alternative. This presents them with a different kind of So I, you know, I don't I don't think it's the best of us. Sorry, uh, Michael, I'm gonna give my students the last one. Sam, are you I'm I'm interested in this Can you speak up? I'm sorry, I'm getting old. He's reimagined in Africa. Done that, it, it has some kind of politics that enabled that time. You need it because in which in which period? What time? What is it? Sir, when you want actually that? Ah, sure. ah. Um, if it has any influence, then what kind of politics that emerged from there? Particularly considering the kind of politics that was at that time. All right, I'm going to be quick on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, the first two questions are quite similar. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think Du Bois was very much an intellectual. And he did support political movements and of course the formation of the NAACP was itself a sort of a major political act and and he of course saw himself as a political actor when he is editing the crisis magazine um, but he's not with the people I mean he's not spending time I, I haven't I, I, it, it would be an interesting research project to see to what extent he was participating in, in, in I don't know political marches for example he did stand, by the way, for the American Progressive Party, um, American Labour Party, I guess, um, as it was in New York, which was like the front of the Communist Party in 1950, and um, and sort of was campaigning, um, probably on a largely on an anti-imperialist uh, platform. Uh, he got 80,000 votes, and so it was not bad, um, but you know, he didn't win a senatorial position. Um, but anyway, he did, that, so that's, that was quite close, to getting him so involved in politics um, on the ground. He did talk to, he did address audiences, and in his latter years, he was talking to the, as I was said earlier, the communist, the, the, the young communists in the South. Um, but, you know, he was not, yeah, he's not, he was not a, not a leader of, 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 of the people in the same way that, that Garvey was, the, the, the obvious comparison, as we were saying. And so, yeah, so I mean, I think what, 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 Carl, what you say sounds exactly right. I mean, I think that's, that's the dangers of political engagement is you develop blind spots. I mean, that's the character of political engagement. And that, and in those terms, the support for China and the support for the Soviet Union was a political move. However, it, what, was, what did he have to, what, he didn't declare it as such. And, and as he was saying, the ANC also had a close relationship. And for similar reasons, the support that the Soviet Union seems to be giving to the ANC um, and, of course, the SACP. So 
So yeah, I, I think that's that, that you that you like this. You say it, yeah, you use the word extreme alienation. Um, but I think it's also this anti-imperial vision that is it also behind his, his vision of the rest of the world. And finally, yes, Ghana. Uh, 